Hello and welcome to session two. Uh, session two, we will be talking about IT and digitalization in the automotive industry. Obviously, in session one, we heard about how Hungary is no longer focusing on low-cost manufacturing, um, but is really pushing forward high-tech. So in this session, we will be looking at um, some of the digital technologies and processes which are being implemented in the automotive industry in Hungary and also in the wider region. My name is Joanne Perry and I am the editor of Automotive Logistics. And on the panel today in this session, we've got Paulina Cimilas, Senior Manager Business Process Definition at Jaguar Land Rover. Apologies for the pronunciation, I know that wasn't perfect, um, far from it. Um, next we have Alphonse Dax Wiesinger, who is Director Logistics Services at Magnus Steyr. And then we have Anthony Evans, who is Vice President of SOS CE. So without further ado, I would like to invite Paulina to give her presentation. Thanks, John. Good morning. Um, or maybe from this one. My session will be today very much focused on the other side of IT implementation and digitalization, on making sure that the implementations actually get um, implemented correctly and they sustain in the environments we are having around our plants or around our supply ch uh, chains. Um, my session is titled From Requirements to Capabilities, End-to-end um, -end Solutions Around IT and Around Digitalization. It is, um, the goal for my presentation, it is to uh, give you a little bit of a brief of what am I looking at in JLR implementing or upgrading our IT infrastructures, but at the same time uh, to take a look not only at the pure technology, but as well as the people and the processes that actually make the technology work. Perfect. Um, across all of our uh, companies and across all of our plants in JLR, uh, we are facing right now quite significant IT landscape updates. Those IT landscape consider three categories or three areas of our work. Uh, one is related to equipment, so very technical part of the updates, um, infrastructure, um, all of the background of what uh, we are facing and operating with the IT systems, so the software, especially the ones that are not only people on the shop floor, but as well as people in front of the computers are using, and the processes themselves. And here I would like to emphasize on the processes as the key thing that I would like to discuss or actually show you uh, today. Um, Business process itself has to be defined at all times. We all know IATF requirements, we all know that we have to operate in a stable environment, but at the same time, business process itself is usually defined for the standard happy path, for the positive process, not necessarily for the negative path, unhappy scenarios or change scenarios. This is where um, a lot of IT systems has inflexibilities or problems around, and usually this is where our employees turn into paper. Um, main thing is, when we actually have a process um, in our plants or in our supply chain, uh, what this process means, how is it defined, where do we take our business requirements from? So where our business actually defines what our processes or what the list of our processes should be. How do we define them? How do we validate them? Every single day, every single employee in the plants or in the supply chain or in the logistics has a brilliant new idea. This is the new way I would like to do stuff. This is the new functionality of IT system I would like to have. How do we as companies validate those ideas, those requirements, which very often are called change requests? Um, 
when we actually validated such an idea and we know it's a good and it's not, we know it's going to be a brilliant new thing that's going to add value to our operations, how do we change them into capabilities? The capabilities are installed, defined new uh, things in our operating systems that our employees can use and ultimately improve our business. One of the examples I wanted to show today is a very basic capability from the plant that's called part verification. We all know that for the traceability requirements and for the um, basic um, production control requirements, we have to um, scan major components. There's always the list of the mandatory ones. There's always the list of the ones that we want to validate for coincidence check, for accuracy check, to check with the bill of materials, etc. cetera. Um, business process would ultimately say, pick a part, scan the code, put the part in the car. What happens if the scanner doesn't work? What happens if the barcode doesn't work? Everything around alternative scenarios during our manufacturing processes is part of the process. When we actually started touching this with our new IT systems, the positive and the basic scenario had three steps. When we started calculating all of the negative and change and alternatives and everything that can happen to us, well, I ended up with 200 pages of our functional requirements. <laughs> How to make it simple, how to validate it, that's the whole process that the companies have to set up. But ultimately, you will end up with a capability, like you see here on the screen. The capability tells us there is a step that you see on the screen, is the first one here. The one that is running is where the system waits for the operator to pick apart, scan it with the scanner and put it in the car. If the step has failed, the system will tell the operator that it has failed and it will record it. And now, what to do? Well, in our plant in Slovakia, a supervisor has access to actually validate is that correct, has a special supervisor login, can override that step, add extra data to it, and we mark it as a failed step override. That's from a process through requirements to a capability basic stuff, how to then make it sustainable for thousands of operators that we are seeing around the plants or anywhere else around our company. This system that you saw on the previous slide and all of the technology, all the scanners mean nothing if the people cannot use it. If we are unable or our training is not sufficient or not accurate or not on the job or people cannot translate the classroom training to the shop floor or to the computers they have in front of them, we cannot sustain implementations and the processes won't be followed and ultimately the plants will stop. Um, all of our capabilities, aka all the processes, we have to test before we deploy we have to train extensively our people and we have to provide business as usual support after implementation. Multiple ways of doing that, but in the end, we have to ensure that when actually business as usual operations happen, people who have a problem during the process, they have a, somebody to call, somebody to text or some website to check it. Depends where you are. If you are an MPNL person working on MRP in front of subsystem, you maybe have 10, 15, 20 minutes to wait. If you are an operator on a tag time over one minute, you don't. So your support system has to have multiple ways, multiple levels and multi multiple response times. How do we deploy our processes? Well, basic stuff here on the right side, your left. Uh, we start with the requirements. We define them in multiple ways. We go then into capabilities. So a defined validated requirement that we know that will improve our business is turned into a capability. That capability is then developed by our IT departments or, or our uh, partners. Then teams like mine go into use cases where we actually define real life scenarios when that capability needs to be tested. 
Then we actually go into proper test phases. Um, test cases can be done from the basic stuff through very uh, complicated stuff. It all depends how much would you like to have your capability resistant to problems. We do very extended testing, multiple ways of testing and multiple phases, and we go into extensive hypercare. After implementation, we go through process audits and process confirmations. We usually use trainers, we usually use process leads, um, the people who actually have from the beginning developed the requirements and brought it in. And we control the usage of our IT systems. Uh, there's multiple um, software uh, providers that can do that. You can do it also on your own. Uh, the ultimate thing is, after you implement it, there will be the honeymoon period where people will really use the IT system and they're going to be really happy about it. And then comes the phase that they're not so interested anymore. And if the IT system is bad and if your processes are wrong, people will just ultimately stop. How do you know? We control the usage. On SAP, it's very simple. SAP has tools for that. On manufacturing systems and the shuffle applications are a little bit more difficult, but you can always check the logins. You can always check the active time. There's multiple ways of doing that. And then the people themselves. How do we train our people? First of all, we don't train on transactions. We train on the process. We train on what's your inputs, who's your supplier, what's your processing, What's your output? Who's your customer? Then we train on the data. We have trainings on master data, but also the data relevant to the actual process that a particular person will do. We simulate. And on, again, on SAP it's easy. On another software, uh, especially the ones that are related to equipment, not so easy, but that's where you have test labs. We let people, people run and run and run with the same processes until they feel comfortable. Uh, we deliver test labs where we have equipment related to IT systems. We deliver training environments to our people that are being continuously fed with a lot of data so that it can be consumed. And we run experiments. Training environments allow people to run experiments and pretty much uh, I usually will um, tell people Try to break the system in your training environment, in your testing environment. Try to break it so that you feel comfortable that it's not going to fall apart. A typical trainee will go through the basic stuff. It's all process-based. You have a lot of classroom. I'm talking here mostly the MPNL people, uh, the ones that usually will sit in front of a computer all day long. We do a lot of quizzes, we do a lot of checks with them, but the thing that we have been recently doing was a much more interaction with the user while he's being trained. Um, so first of all, we, we have simulations. Uh, simulations uh, are short videos that our employees can go at every single time and either see it uh, passively or actually interact with the simulation by the options. We have onshore hypercare, and we have uh, support applications. They are in-apps, and employees have real-time access to the simulation. So while they're on the screen on the transaction they have to perform, they have immediate access right next to the buttons that they have to do so they can refresh themselves, see the simulation, and then actually perform the process if they don't feel comfortable or they want to make it right. We go through the tips, we go through the updates, and in the end, all of that is being monitored. Have they done it correctly? All of that wraps into a positive, sustainable IT systems implementations, and uh, we all know how many different IT applications we have in our companies. I'm sure nobody has one. Um, the important thing is it's all integrated. We can always have multiple IT systems. If we approach all of them in the same way, that's where people will learn the methods, learn the processes, and that's way where they're going to feel much calmer when they're going to actually have to approach the screen. Final thoughts. All of our IT upgrades, digitalization, infrastructure, 
new apps, or they all come from new business requirements. Is it the speed? So more server power, faster apps. Is it the flexibility? Is it visibility, especially on supply chain, or productivity and costs? It always has to be connected to the process. Without the transformation of the process from this is how it used to be, here's the new IT system, this is how it's going to be in the now, and by appropriate skills and training of the new and appropriate saying goodbye to the old one, we will never sustain the new technologies. And I'm sure all of us has at least one example of such a thing. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you, Paulina. Um, I think one of the most important points there was um, when you said technology is effectively meaningless unless people know how to use it. Um, so I think that's something um, for the question and answer session to get into a little bit more. Um, but now I'd like to invite Alphonse to give his presentation. So good morning, also from my side. Um, excellent presentation about introduction of new systems. Um, I would like to take the opportunity uh, to introduce to you two of our digitalization projects uh, we have implemented in, in the uh, past um, couple of months. And um, yeah, I would like to start off with uh, a short introduction of our company just to get you an overview. Um, where, um, what the environment is. Um, Magna Steyr is one of the product groups within Magna International. It's a 39, almost 39 billion US dollar uh, company, uh, 339 manufacturing assembly sites worldwide. Um, Magna Steyr, as I said, is a, a product, product group within um, Magna International dealing with engineering of complete vehicles, but also um, modules and systems. Um, and the main part uh, where I will be focusing on is complete vehicle manufacturing. That means uh, for our customers, uh, we build uh, and assemble complete vehicles uh, with a world-class flexible solution. Um, the third pillow is uh, fuel systems, uh, which is engine energy storage systems uh, made of steel, plastic, and aluminum. That's all from the company. Uh, now let's focus on the, on the location in, in Graz, Austria. Uh, that gives, uh, this slide gives you an overview. It's um, um, a rather developed, um, historically developed uh, plant. Uh, currently we built uh, five different vehicles uh, for three of our customers. Um, we start off with a Jaguar, the E-Pace and the I-Pace. I-Pace, the full electric vehicle, the first one, building in Graz. Um, the new Mercedes G-Class, uh, which was renewed uh, this year uh, completely. And for BMW, the 5 Series limousine, and um, now recently started uh, the Z4. And very nice car. Um, and there is one left that will be um, started next year. I will be talking about digitalization uh, projects and um, our holistic strategic approach to it is uh, called Smart Factory by Magna Steyr. So that's really a, all the, the use cases or category of use cases uh, we are dealing with uh, to be prepared for future challenges. And um, like I said, I will talk about uh, two of the examples in, in logistics. The first one is um, called MIAT. Um, uh, it's like, like every project in an artificial name, but it's essentially uh, the GPS monitoring for long distance GIS uh, transportation and high volume just in time routes. Um, it was um, awarded this year, and we're pretty proud of it, uh, by Automotive Logistics uh, for the Inbound Network Optimization Award. And um, if we take the initial situation uh, that was uh, in, 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 the, in the course of, of the introduction of the new production of, of, of the new vehicles, 
um, we saw a major trend from local cheese deliveries to long distance cheese deliveries. So the, the distances from the supplier to the plant increased from less than 20 kilometers uh, from the plant to up to 1,200 and uh, a couple of them or even more. So the, the monitoring of those shipments is really crucial and, and essential. On the one hand, uh, the, our logistic service providers are responsible to, to monitor them. Yes, but it does not work 100%, I have to admit. So uh, we th were thinking about a smart way um, how, to, how to improve uh, this process. And uh, what we did was uh, we implemented uh, GPS boxes on the trailers because especially uh, the management of the trailers uh, is, is rather critical. So no trailer um, is allowed to pass uh, the former one and so on. And um, we take this G the, 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 the signals of these GPS boxes and uh, they are checked every five minutes. So it's rather a relevant uh, data traffic every five minutes and compared in a web portal from Gatehouse uh, against the planned schedules. When the uh, system recognizes that there is an issue that the estimated time or the planned uh, time of arrival will not be met because of any issue, then we, uh, the operator, the plant operator, uh, gets an alert email with all the information, engine is running of the truck, um, uh, what speed he's at, and, and so on. And then we can start investigating. In the initial phase, um, just the plant got uh, this email alert and our service providers, of course, were complaining, you know it first uh, than we and so on. Uh, we have an issue with that. And so we send also um, simultaneously a copy to the service provider and then no interaction actually is necessary because the service provider tries to find out what happened. And if there is wrong alert, then fine. If there is an issue, you can take immediately action and measures and, and uh, avoid any um, uh, bigger impact on, on production. So that's really a, a nice feature. Like I said, the, there, is, there are a lot of data you're gathering. And um, then we thought, okay, how can we improve our reporting? You may know the, the different steps of reporting levels. And uh, we, we, we try to improve also the reporting. So really to get in, uh, 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 towards the step four, step five um, <laughs> level of maturity is like trend detection and decision support. And uh, what we did was that we uh, use a um, um, available tool for, for uh, the data and analytics. And uh, you can dig into those kind of data. So you can filter them, you can um, visualize them, and therefore the, the idea is to see correlations and, and um, impacts uh, to your transports and routes and take information for the planning people to improve uh, the, the planning of the schedules. So there's some, some kind of examples um, what what data you can get out, and it's pretty pretty simple, and that's exactly what, what you're trying to achieve. So what are the potentials then? Prediction of delays. Where do we get problems all the time or more often than, than um, on other uh, routes? So supporting the planning uh, improvements and detect and understand correlations. So that's, that's really the, the benefit um, of this project. When I get to the next one, that's the iTrace mobile solution. So it's the digitalization of the loading list of, uh, for returnable containers. Um, how many trucks do we get per day? It's about 1,000. So it, improve, it increased from 500 to 1,000 a day. And uh, if you see the layout of the plant, it's, um, it's like I said, it's, it's historically uh, grown. So we have about 35 unloading areas in the plant and about 25 um, unloading areas at external logistics centers. Um, and that is some kind of um, complexity that you have to deal with. What else was the initial situation? 
the new programs um, in, 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 in the past required that we increase production capacity and uh, therefore we um, reduced the available space and that included also um, uh, the waiting areas. So there are almost no waiting areas anymore for, for, for the trucks. And the logistics uh, operation was also, uh, was also um, moved uh, to external locations. And um, that, of course, is the challenge uh, to, in combination with uh, the increase of the arriving truck quantity, from 500 to 1,000, that we have to think about a smarter way to um, guide the trucks through the system. The past process required the truck, for when, when they wanted to load empty containers, to park three times during the process. That, of course, is not the best way and the smartest way to do it. And the idea was then uh, just to uh, stop one time when they arrive at the plant and, and ask, for, ask for, for entry and, and uh, loading, loading empty containers. Also, the, the process, the past process was manual administration, no connection to the transport management system, communication via different channels, paper, paper, paper. We want to move towards a, a, a digital workflow we wanted to um, have direct connection to the TMS, no double data entry or something like that, and communication of all involved partners in one known environment. What is now iTrace? So iTrace is part of, of the transport management system and one application, it's the newest application to it. So, um, it's a very integrated system and also the transport management system is integrated into our ERP system and communicates with the ERP and, and the logistical um, warehouse management system. So the solu solution approach was then to, uh, to combine mobile devices. So the, the forklift truck driver has already um, a tablet on the forklift where the uh, warehouse management system is running and then have also the application um, iTrace on it and, and give the forklift driver a very smooth um, new process element that you can integrate. Uh, tr improve in transparency. So we wanted to have um, a real-time tracking of the loading status and um, mobile app and, and use of the tablet. We wanted to have the truck getting out the plant faster. So how does the new loading process look like? The truck arrives at the plant, gets registered. We hand over uh, the, an RFIT tag for the uh, truck guiding system. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's a simple card. Uh, that opens the gate then uh, if he's allowed to enter and also when he um, leaves the plant then the gate only opens if everything um, uh, is finished in the workflow. So the load details and the RFID, RFID tag ID are linked in the transport management system. Um, he receives the plant routing instructions where he has to go for loading and so on and um, he is allowed to enter the plant um, or drive to the external logistics center. It's really a, a, a central, central uh, registration. When the forklift uh, truck driver um, meets the, the, the forklift driver meets the truck driver, he scans the RFID tag with the camera of, of the tablet. He, the digital loading list appears on the tablet. Um, he confirms the loaded quantity or corrects the loading, loaded quantities and the driver confirms and signs the loading list on the tablet. The next thing is that the um, central uh, dispatcher receives and monitors that loading um, uh, activity, confirms again uh, the, the loaded quantities and releases the freight documents uh, to be printed at the loading dock, the uh, printouts of the documents, it's still paper, but that's the only paper then is handed over to the truck driver by the forklift um, driver and uh, the, the truck can leave 
without any further delay or parking uh, the plant or the external logistics center. And uh, the RFID tag is returned at the plant gates. The benefits, just a short, short summary of, of that, the benefits um, are really the, every objective we, we, we set was, was uh, completed, was done. So reduction of waiting areas, definitely we, we reduced it maybe uh, probably to, 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 to a very minimum. Um, we have all the documents in the system, so it's paperless, except the, the freight documents. We reduced the administrative effort. It's a very user-friendly mobile app because of a, a tablet is also um, big enough that you can um, operate it with your fingers. Um, we can, we're able to handle twice as much um, uh, truck entries uh, into the plant. We have direct connection in the transport management system. It's really a digital workflow, one system, and uh, we're part of the Smart Factory Initiative. So the, in, the, the final advantages is really the increased security, improved transparency, digital document management, and a very efficient loading process. In numbers, we reduced about 80 tons CO2 emissions per year because of less waiting time, um, starting the engine, and additional traffic. Um, we saved or avoided, we avoided uh, approximately 360,000 euros because we did not have to um, place people, administrative people, to our external logistics centers because we could um, uh, concentrate uh, it on, on, on a central office. And uh, we reduced about 50,000 hours per year, or avoided 50,000 hours per year um, transport time for our truck drivers because they are faster on the road now. So that's really also um, a, a huge benefit uh, of this project. At the end, people were happy. And um, also our, our logistics service providers um, recognized that both projects um, give some improvements and uh, make life a little bit easier. So thank you very much for your attention. And I guess the questions, if you have one, will be asked later then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alphonse. Um, it was very good to hear about some recent projects. And uh, again, we can, we can dig into that a bit later and ask some, uh, some questions for more details. Um, uh, next, we have Anthony, who he doesn't actually have a presentation, but he's going to introduce himself and uh, say a little bit about his company, um, possibly from the comfort of his armchair. Thank you, Anthony. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anthony Evans. I work for a company called uh, Sows Components and uh, Electronics KFT. Uh, we're part of a far bigger group called Sumitomo Electric and their automotive-focused uh, company, Sumitomo Wiring Systems. Uh, we are actually the, the biggest wire harness manufacturer in the world, and one in four cars have a Sumitomo harness in it. I, know, I think there are members from Yuzaki here, and they may want to debate where, whether we're the biggest or they're the biggest. Uh, maybe we can discuss, discuss that over lunch. We're a vertically integrated company, uh, so we manufacture the wire and the components and assemble the harness. My part of the business is actually in the uh, connector and electronics uh, manufacturing part of the, our supply chain. We, uh, our factory is in Hungary. Uh, we employ about 700 people. We have a distribution center also in Budapest, and we supply about 285 customers on a weekly basis from OEMs such as uh, JLR and uh, actually formerly Magna when you made the Mini, uh, right through to small guys in a shed building their harness for their, uh, their old MG sports car. So quite a complex supply chain. Uh, our main challenges really regarding digitization is the management of a huge uh, inbound amount of order data. As I said, we have 285 different customers we deliver to on a weekly basis. 
And, and those customers we deliver up to maybe 150 part numbers down to one part number. So the amount of order data that we're getting in is, is quite significant. And ideally, we would like to digitize our supply chain in line with uh, industry 4.0 goals to take that data right through and push it into our manufacturing plant with as little uh, manual input as possible. But the issues that we face is 285 different customers, and Paulina said, you know, even within, uh, within one company, there are many different systems. So you can imagine with 285 dif different customers, even if they're part of the same group, the data's um, presented in different ways and with um, uh, different levels of, of accuracy. So that's, that's a big challenge for us, is, is pulling that data in and uh, ensuring we have the data quality before we can use it to drive further processes down, down, the, down the supply chain. And one other weakness I see currently with digitization is that as we rely more and more on, on systems to process our data, when something goes wrong, it's very difficult to get down to the root cause of that, that issue. So if we have a sudden de demand spike or slump from one of our customers, it's very difficult to get down to the root cause of that. Is it a real demand spike? Do we really have to react quickly? Or is it a problem in their system or the way the data was transferred to us? And because people aren't as close to the data as they used to be maybe when they were doing the planning individually, then it's very difficult to, to, get, to that, get to that answer. And recently, we had that issue with um, uh, when uh, Ford announced some production stops in Spain and, uh, and Germany. The, the information came to us very slowly with very little understanding because everybody was relying on Ford's MRP uh, process to drive their MRP process to drive their schedules to us. So digging down into whether we had to react or not was, was very difficult. So although I think there's huge advantages to digitization in terms of efficiency, I think there are also some risks in terms of the, the lack of understanding of the, uh, of the data. And as Paulina said, again, referring back to her very interesting presentation, that has to be part of the training when we're implementing these systems, is to ensure what, what is happening to the data that's being generated and make sure that people do understand it. So if there is an issue, they can get down to the root cause of that issue. Thank you. So um, we'll move on to the question and answer session now. Um, I've got plenty of questions, but if anybody from the audience would like to say something, ask a question, or make a comment, just uh, put your hand up and somebody will come with a microphone. Uh, and if you could state your name and your company, that would be much appreciated. There's a question just over here. Hello, uh, my name is Anna Gromba from Eurasia Logistics, and I have a question to Paulina. If you could uh, please el elaborate a little bit more on how would you normally do the validation of the ideas? As you mentioned that uh, like every day somebody is having the great idea on improvement, how do you actually perform the validation and what do you do with those which were not uh, to taken for the change request? If you keep the record on these ideas, how do you keep people motivated if their great suggestion was not, uh, was not proceeded? And so on, if you could talk a little bit more about this issue, please. Oh, yeah, Thank, sure. you. Thank you. Um, the first thing I always, um, the, the first thing that we always will approach uh, with the team is um, work with the um, local process leads and global process leads. Um, so you actually have dedicated people who, um, on a regular basis, of course, rotate, so you keep the momentum happening. Uh, but uh, there is always a single person that is the expert on the process that you are supposed to improve. And whomever has an idea around that process first has to work with that person. When, I, when an idea for an improvement actually is defined, so they know more or less on a very high level what they want to do, um, the first thing is to validate it against typical definition of, is it a must have, is it a should have, could have or would have? And then, is there a business case for it? So do you actually, your improvement idea, is it going to actually generate either a cost improvement or time improvement? 
and then those people actually understand how they should generate their ideas so they are um, bringing those benefits to the company. Then if it actually shows on that level, in the first instance, um, rough order of magnitude, there is a business case, it's going to bring improvements, it goes into an impact assessment so that the company and the whole chain behind that process is validated. And um, those are the typical small ideas, the everyday ideas. At the same time, you have to take a look at serious steps forward. Not every idea will have a very good business case. Your company must have directions on uh, what kind of business case results they're going to take under consideration uh, to fund such improvements or projects or IT changes. Uh, but uh, some of the ideas or some of the changes you might f see in front of you not necessarily going to bring you in very short period of time return on your investments or significant improvements. And that's where your strategical decision comes in place. Am I get taking that step forward? Am I digitalizing or um, improving or mo moving IT into a process or not? Or am I keeping paper and pen? Okay, any more comments or questions? Maybe on a different subject. Yes, question here. Just at the front. Hola, Scuti. Jaguar Land Rover. The question would be, how did you live through the first implementation in, uh, in Slovakia, in Nitra, after the different factories in, uh, in the UK or in Brazil? So what is the difference? What would you suggest to the others? Um much larger business involvement into IT implementation. Um, knowledge, much larger knowledge transfers, and um, complete group of people who are related to a capability or functionality other than single specialists. So we have moved beyond the typical name of super user or key business user. We actually have groups on this and the IT systems implementations have actually moved into a business, uh, business readiness and business implementations and business go lives, where the key driving force is um, the operational implementation of the system. So not only dropping up empty IT system on the, on the plant, but actually the preparation of it, the data, the um, configurations, and the complete chain of events that you usually will call as a cutover or go life plan and then post go life activities and then um, hyper care period. Much larger, uh, much bigger uh, set of work in that area than previous implementations. So I expect the, um, the new plant in Slovakia was a big opportunity for JLR to change its processes. Um, do you think that anything um, being implemented now in Slovakia will actually make its way back to the UK factories? Yes. Um, we are working on a plan. Uh, we have to ensure that our implementations in Slovakia uh, bring benefits to the UK plants because some of the capabilities that we have delivered in Slovakia, even though with new IT systems, actually exist in UK. So we have to be sure that we're not gonna disrupt the life of the factories in UK. But at the same time, we know that the new IT systems are much faster and give us much bigger visibility into our operations than the ones that we have in UK. Mm. Um, one thing I will say is, bringing a new IT system to a brownfield is a cultural shift for any company. It's not a greenfield plant. Slovakia is a greenfield, but we had people from multiple companies coming in, so they had to new, learn the new IT systems. So that's a very, very big area of work. Hmm. So, um, you know, just sort of going to the question of the interaction between technology and people, 
what kind of training programs were put in place for the Slovakian plant? Depends on the roles for the people. Um, out of the processes, we have identified process roles, and that was mapped to our uh, organization. Depending on the IT system and the environment, a particular person was uh, planned to work in, and there was a training plan for the processes. Uh, based on the training, um, we started with three basic uh, areas of training. Uh, one was um, knowledge transfers from our key specialists in the systems. Those were usually one-to-one -one sessions to the key people. We needed to be um, trained above average. Then most of the users uh, were required to participate in the testing phases to actually perform test cases on the system. Then we moved into standard training programs, which um, included classroom training for typical applications uh, for office uh, employees and a training academy. There is an enormous training academy in Nitra that is training of all of our staff. And uh, we uh, delivered to all of our uh, teams simulations and they have requirements to perform X amount of simulations and X amount of uh, training environment exercises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any more questions about the Slovakia plant? Um, I've got quite a few, but obviously we will have to, to move along a little bit. Any more questions or comments? Um, just, just again, uh, Paulina, um, do you have any comment on uh, the recruitment of people with these um, IT skills that, that um, manufacturers need now. Do you think in Hungary there's a su sufficient supply of people with those skills? Um, I expect maybe demographically perhaps uh, perhaps it might be an advantage over the UK, for example. It might be a, a younger population with, with more um, IT savvy people. Is that true? Um, the, those people are everywhere. If, if we search correctly, we, we find them. Um, I have to say that the amount of um, events, um, training, and opportunities in the area of digitalization that I am seeing in this part of the, of the world is extreme. Of course, uh, you're always going to try to compare yourself with US or China, but here in, in Europe, even as we speak right now, I know about a simultaneous event dedicated to digitalization that's happening in Liverpool and in Bratislava at the same time. Mm. Um, and those are technical events. Um, those are for people who are working on Industry 4.0, on digitalization, pure technology workshops. And uh, young people are extremely interested. It's a matter then of they will develop something they will find a new technology they're extremely interested in. Does it fit to your company? Are you in ability to um, take it in? Hmm. Digitalization is, is surely one of those things that should get younger people interested in the automotive industry. You know, it's not the case that people are just standing on a production line anymore and sort of plugging parts into cars. There's all kinds of interesting technologies to get involved with. So I think communicating that to, to younger people and, and reaching out to the universities and so on and colleges would be something that would help the automotive industry. Um, but uh, Anthony was shaking his head in the quest to the question of, um, is there a sufficient supply of, of trained people? Trained people, I think there's not a sufficient supply of. Uh, I agree with Paulina uh, again, that, uh, that uh, there is a pool of people there who are willing to gain the skills, but you do have to in invest in the training, I think. Um, I think in terms of the market availability, people who can walk in and start programming, etc. tomorrow, uh, it's very tight. Um, but there are young people that, again, if you can enthuse them, they are, they are there and willing to, willing to be trained. And it's, it's very important that uh, when you're marketing yourself as a company, that you market yourself the opportunities that people have within the business, not just in terms of financial gain, but also in terms of their ability to, to grow and improve their, uh, their knowledge and also, you know, lifestyle benefits as well. So uh, I think it's uh, the opportunities there as long as you approach it correctly from an HR point of HR and development point of view. But if you want to make a big change tomorrow, 
then it would be, it, the, the resource is, is lacking, unless you're willing to pay for it, of course. Hmm. And um, just speaking about the, the factories that you have in, in Hungary, that SOS has in Hungary, um, are they mostly, is it mostly manual processes or is there any automation there? Uh, it's, it's a com combination. Um, new products are, uh, are mainly produced uh, uh, by, automa by automation and in fact, you know, if, if you're wanting to work with uh, a quality uh, OEM such as JLR or, or BMW, they insist that as much as the assembly process is automatic as, as automatic as possible to reduce manual errors and in, improve quality. So it's not just an efficiency thing, but it's, it's a, a must for guaranteeing the quality of the, of the product that we supply. Mm -hmm. any, any comments about the human talent aspect or, or anything else in relation to the presentations? Any questions? Question just here at the front. Uh, Baker Sinus with Cartainer International. Uh, a question to the panel in, in general. Uh, during my couple of years now within automotive logistics, I feel I've seen too many cases where IT becomes a restriction rather than an, uh, an enabler, where you have, there's a process missing, so instead of, instead of uh, figuring out or changing the process, ch changing the IT, the IT becomes the baseline for how the supply chain works and not the other way. So I guess the, the question is like, how do you consider your, yourself and your organizations to become more flexible and, and more adaptable in, in the way you implement and, and use your IT in the supply chain? <laughs> I, I guess I have to comment. Um, that is true. <laughs> in, in, in a certain uh, uh, content, this is true. So um, if you're talking about um, ERP systems, yes, I 100% agree. Um, in our case, uh, what we see is um, uh, with, um, for example, transport management system, uh, which is the main uh, system in my area, um, then of course you're dealing with uh, partners and, and specialists and, and, and you're trying to, to step ahead and, and, and be at the forefront. So, um, so to a certain extent, yes, it's possible to, to, uh, to go ahead and, 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 and uh, step in front of, uh, of everybody. But um, there is a backbone and uh, that has to be a very robust, stable system. And th therefore, that is probably also a reason why um, it might look like a restriction. You should always check if that flexibility that you are searching for is bringing you something new or actually get, gaining you something or you're actually trying to do something that's not according to process. Because um, some of those IT systems are so rigid for a reason. ERPs, there is a lot of accountability there and a lot of finance related <laughs> data. So not necessarily has to be flexible. At the same time, transport management should be very flexible. Um, it's about the technology that the IT system is built on. Some of them uh, can be adjusted or the workflow can be um, worked through. Uh, some of them cannot. Um, only when you are actually understanding where you have to maintain a stable process and you're not allowed to change it, but where your flexibility areas come from, that's where you can search for your uh, more flexible, uh, easier IT systems. Yeah, I agree with uh, Paulina and Alphonse. <coughs> it depends how much the business is, is, in, is using one, one system. So we have a lot of customers who use SAP all the way through, through the chain. And that's exactly the answer we get. If we want to change something or we ask something, this is even with our suppliers as well. No, you can't do that because SAP needs it like this. But um, when you get to, to, to the logistics elements that maybe aren't so integrated with the ERP system that impacts uh, financials, etc., uh, companies who, who uh, have specialized maybe WMS systems or, 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 or other logistics control systems can be more flexible. So I really think it's down to uh, the, strategy, the strategy and size of the company. 
because some smaller companies, they put all their money into SAP and to change anything in SAP. I understand it's very expensive. Unfortunately, we don't use SAP. Um, so I think smaller companies maybe are more rigid than, than companies such as, such as these guys who maybe have more resource and bigger teams and more power against the software providers as well. Any more questions? Yes, please, please. Question at the back. My name is uh, Shimon Peter, or in English, Peter Simon. I'm coming from uh, Zola Zone, the new proving ground in Hungary for autonomous connected and electric vehicle uh, validation and homologation. I just have one question. We, uh, in, the, in the STEM area of, of uh, human resources, looking for these new engineers or scientists or um, or mathematicians, we're, we're also developing in our business model a whole way to recruit or develop uh, our supply chain of people. And I just wondered, uh, what is your engagement with your universities in your regions? Uh, what kind of programs do you have with them? How do you engage R&D potentially for Industry 4.0, also to include not just the IT uh, system, but also extend that into robotization? Anyway, I would like to ask each of you a, uh, an example of uh, what you're doing. Thanks. Who wants to go first? <laughs> um, JLR has multiple programs. Um, pretty much in every country that we operate, we have an engagement and relationships with local schools, universities, and um, um, different institutions. Unfortunately, I cannot give you a particular example because I'm not responsible for that. Those are our HR departments that uh, handle this. I work directly with hired employees already, so I'm only really responsible up to defining the roles and responsibilities and the skill set of those people. If there is a gap, definitely there are programs. Um, it is extremely important to uh, cooperate with schools and universities. Um, the sooner the young people will understand and know that such a world exists, especially in rural areas, the sooner they get interested and start uh, learning and start communicating with you. The same is with our company. So we, we have multiple um, partnerships with schools, high schools and, and technical high schools and, and universities. Um, that is very important because that's really, um, I would say, a fight for, for, for the talents. Um, so they are not so available uh, because uh, uh, the business now is, is, is really very, very, very hot and, and uh, fighting for new people. Um, so it's, it's important to, um, uh, to get the people know and also to get uh, the people know our company, the opportunities. Uh, we work with them uh, for um, uh, jobs uh, in summertime, for example, or, or uh, master thesis and uh, diplomas and, and so on. So that's quite important and, and really essential. Uh, from our side, I'm embarrassed to say that we don't have any strategic alliances with, with any, any universities. And Alphonse makes a very good point. You know, you take a, a worldwide, uh, world-famous company like Magnus Steyr, and it's even important for them to, to teach uh, potential uh, recruits about the company and what they do. So that's even more important for a company such as ours, um, where probably none of you, apart from my, my five colleagues who are here, had probably heard of us before even though we were one of the top 15 automotive suppliers in the world. Um, having said that, we're fortunate that uh, one or two of our members have taken it upon themselves and got involved with uh, local universities and supporting some of their uh, uh, internal competitions for logistics improvements, etc. And just to show you how successful it can be, is actually we've, we've got one very good guy who... Uh, we engaged with through one of these competitions, and now he he's uh, our packet our, our group packaging engineer. So so it, it it unfortunately we don't do anything. We should do something. It's very important, and even through uh, one person taking the initiative, we've managed to gain one good person. So that shows that it can work. And um, there's another question which actually comes through the app. Um, I believe it's for Alphonse. It says, how did you get the truck service providers on board? Did it require installation of tablets on trucks? 
who bore the cost for these installations on the trucks. I think that's in relation to MIAT. Right, right. Um, fortunately, this was a very strategic approach, so uh, we did the requirement before the RFQ. <laughs> So there was already a requirement in the RFQ, so it's, uh, so to speak, it's, it's baked into the, into the price of the service. Um, so that was, um, that was quite easy. Um, if, if it would be the other way around and you would get um, up later on, that might be um, a little bit more discussion, but um, it's, it's quite uh, inexpensive. So it's, it's not a real high investment, so I uh, cannot say, say any numbers, but, it, but it's really nothing compared to, to uh, an investment into a trailer or a truck. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? Okay, just one back right. Okay. Um, I, my name is Elizaveta. I represent uh, the Russian company uh, producing uh, and selling commercial vehicles. It's gas group. I'm afraid nobody knows it. <laughs> but still it exists. And the question is uh, uh, like that. Uh, then Paulina answered the, the previous question. Uh, you told that um, about criteria of choosing project. Uh, one of them is business case. So the question is, are there some standards at, at your companies? Uh, the question to everyone. Uh, regarding payback period. Uh, normally every IT project still needs some resources to be invested, uh, money, time, anything. Uh, is it some uh, standard payback period? payback period, yes, then uh, it should be approved or rejected. Question. Um, usually the best way is to ask your finance department. <laughs> <laughs> they will usually tell you what they require you. Um, it's a management decision. Uh, search for TAR. It TAR will always tell you, um, are you more or less 100% or not. If you are less than 100% tar, reconsider the project or shape it uh, in a way that it will actually get the value added. Uh, if you are more than 100% tar, um, your project is beneficial usually, but always consult your finance department correctly. Right, ROI of course is, is important, quite important. So the, the allowed time for the ROI decreases from time to time. <laughs> so um, it's, it's depending on, on the situation or the importance of the project. So for example, if it's a really must have because it's customer driven or so, of course, that's not, not a question of ROI. But um, if it's an improvement project, uh, uh, new opportunities, of course, that is required. And uh, uh, yeah, best thing is to cooperate with your finance department. I just uh, copy paste Alphonse's answer. <laughs> you know, there are some things that you, you definitely need. You need an ERP system, you need WMS, and you know, you can't really fall back on ROI to justify those, they must, but anything additional to uh, the core business requirements must, must achieve the corporate ROI target. So, yeah, can I uh, just yeah, um, comment? Actually, I deal with my <laughs> finance department, and uh, it would be interesting to have some benchmark. Uh, just to talk this well, because sometimes, uh, you know, uh, maybe you, uh, the question is, are there standards in your company, or is it every time, uh, uh, like, separate decision? Maybe you have at least six months, for example, or maximum two years, something like that, some indicators for IT projects. Do you have it or not? It's really uh, depending on the importance of the project uh, in our company, so, but... 12 months is a rule of thumb uh, that is quite good. So if you're below that, you can talk about the project. Okay, I think unfortunately we have to start wrapping up the session. Um, and if you have any more questions, you can try and catch these guys at lunch and disturb them. Um, but before we actually go to lunch, I've got one special guest that I would like to invite to the stage, which is Stuart Stobie from Priority Freight. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, a, a much less weighty topic than uh, IT end to end digitalization, but uh, equally important is lunch. Uh, and Priority Freight, uh, as a, a proud gold sponsor, 
um, have the pleasure to sponsor today's excellent lunch. Uh, for those of you who know us, uh, for those of your customers out there, you will know that uh, Priority Freight delivers the fastest and most reliable uh, time-critical transport solutions to its customers. Uh, and today, the reason we've chosen to sponsor the lunch is it's a, it's a very important day for us too. Um, we've also made an investment uh, in this exciting region uh, to support um, our customers in Hungary, Austria, Czech Republic, um, and also Slovakia, uh, and opened an office just two weeks ago in Bratislava, uh, which is now up and running. Um, that will provide solutions to our customers in this part of the world, uh, and we expect to see it grow in tandem with the growth of the sector in this region. So. Um, if you do use us, thank you very much. Um, come and see us, come and say hello this afternoon. If you don't, uh, then come and see us, come and say hello, and uh, talk to us about how we can support your supply chain. Um, and lunch, I think, will now be served. It will be served in priority freight style, on time, and in perfect condition. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's in the infinity room. So Highly enjoy. expensive. <laughs>